Whenever November comes along, American political observers turn their minds to the upcoming elections because they can't just sit in the corner sobbing all the time. It's unseemly. As things stand now, Democrats are fearful that their election chances may suffer somewhat from the fact that their policies have led to two major wars, surrendered our borders to Mexican cartels, and turned our salaries to dust that was blown away on the winds of inflation into a vast expanse of insubstantial nothingness that used to be our rent and groceries. As DNC chairman Mao Tse Jihad told CNN anchorwoman Vladimir Jihad, no relation, quote, we're concerned that our disastrous policies may have alienated some of our core voters, like dead people, unassigned social security numbers, and bicycle riders with bags filled with mail-in votes from former residents who moved away years ago and are now voting in other states. Without those constituencies, we're not sure we'll be able to garner enough self-righteous white women who don't know anything but feel good when they vote for us for no discernible reason, unquote. To counter the actual effects of their policies, Democrats are hoping to fashion an electoral majority out of voters who stick their ice cream cones in their foreheads because they're too stupid to find their mouths. Political consultants are experimenting with slogans that appeal to the Democrat base, like, Vote Democrat. The country is still standing. Help us finish the job. Or, Extreme MAGA Republicans want to stop you from slaughtering your unborn children, but we won't let them because we're evil like you. Consultants are also hoping Joe Biden's primary campaign will help lift local candidates. They've already filmed one candid campaign commercial in which Biden looks directly into the camera and speaks off the cuff with great sincerity, saying, quote, I'm Joe Biden, heb demina babadabalu norvis katuman, unquote. Then he falls on his face. In another commercial, the president is shown gazing off into the distance with a waving American flag superimposed over his image as he speaks in voiceover, saying, quote, my fellow Americans, where am I? And why is that transparent flag waving on my face? And where am I? Unquote. If those commercials don't test well, the campaign may simply go with a bold slogan like, Joe Biden, there's absolutely no proof he's doing what he's doing. On the Republican side, middle-of-the-road GOP consultants and other nostalgic onanists are desperately trying to make Nikki Haley into a thing so she can use a win in the Iowa caucuses as a launchpad to hosting a late-night talk show on OAN. These strategists are hoping that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will leave the race so Nikki can combine his 16% support with her 16% support, which would add up to 16% support since her 16% support is completely imaginary. Haley's campaign slogan would be, Nikki Haley, let's just pretend this whole Trump thing never happened. More realistic Republicans are looking at frontrunner Donald Trump and trying to find ways to expand his support beyond those voters who can stand him. One strategy is to have GOP operatives pose as Democrat protesters at Trump rallies, only instead of calling Trump literally Hitler, they'll call him literally Hamas, since it means exactly the same thing, except Democrats would then vote for him. Strategists are also preparing for the likelihood that Trump may be convicted in one of the many trials charging him with being simultaneously obnoxious and right about everything. If Trump should win the election and be forced to run his presidency from prison, advisors are hoping he might use his reality TV expertise to stage crowd-pleasing events like a riot between the Black Vanguard and the Aryan Brotherhood in which the survivor becomes his chief of staff. This would be an improvement over Trump's former chiefs of staff because at least prison gang members don't rat on you. Such events would be interspersed with commercials, in which prisoners who have dirt on the Clintons are put in solitary confinement on 24-hour suicide watch, yet still somehow manage to hang themselves with Giza dream sheets made with 100% long staple cotton. Use code don't mess with Hillary for a 40% chance of disappearing without a trace. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. All right, we are back laughing our way through the latest attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. Babylon tried it. Rome tried it. Europe tried it. They're all gone and the Jews are so, still here. So have a good time while you're here, Hamas. Uh, the House of Love and Death. I have to, listen, I have to, I know I keep pitching The House of Love and Death as my new novel, the third in the Cameron Winter mystery series. But here's what I would like you to do, if you will. Truly, <laughs> I have it on good authority that the book is selling because of you and because of your kindly pre-ordering it and ordering it 
and because of help from friends like Glenn Beck and uh, and um, and Megan, that book is selling better than some of the books on the New York Times bestseller list. Will they put it on the list? Uh, probably, I, I probably shouldn't. I, as I told as I told my publisher, I probably shouldn't have called them subhuman, uh, anti-Semitic crap monsters. But there you are. That's what they are. So I did. But still, still, if you are planning to buy this book, if you are planning to buy it as a present for anybody, please buy it now. Please buy it now. That gush of people buying it would be really helpful toward pushing it to a point where I don't, I don't know if we can force the Times to put it on the list. I doubt it. But still, if you are thinking of buying it, please do. And once again, let me tell you, I'm sure you will love this book. It's gotten great reviews. It's an Amazon pick. Uh, a, an author whom I don't know, Zach Bissonette, uh, Bissonette said, this is the best new series of the millennium. So unusual and perfect, an actual reinvention of crime fiction. And I only quote that because it happens to be true. I'm not a conservative writing novels. I'm a novelist who's a conservative. And this is, you know, I, I think one of my best books. So please, if you're going to buy it, please buy it now. I really would appreciate it. Also, if you're in New York City, Lower Manhattan, Monday Mysteri- at the Mysterious Bookshop, which is on Warren Street in Lower Manhattan, uh, come by at 6 p.m. and I will be signing books and talking to my friend Otto Penzler about the book. And uh, I would love to meet you. Please do, really. Uh, 6 p.m. Monday at the Mysterious Bookshop in Lower Manhattan. This is also a good time to subscribe to my personal YouTube channel. Uh, we put up all the interviews you can get on the RSS feed. You can get them on wherever you're getting your podcast. But you can also watch them there if you want. And we are in the midst of a series of interviews with the women of Clavendom. Uh, last week, I did my sister, uh, Caitlin Flanagan of The Atlantic. And this week, we will have Faith Moore, uh, the author of the new book, Christmas Carol, which actually is very delightful. And you could order it at the same time you're ordering House of Love and Death. You also get exclusive content sent directly to your house wrapped in anti-Semitic death threats so it won't offend your left-wing neighbors. And if you leave a comment and the comment is absolutely despicable and shockingly right-wing, by golly, we'll read it here because that's what we do. Today's comment is from CyVius917. She says, Drew, your smoldering melted the feminist veneer off my life like that scene from Indiana Jones with the Ark of the Covenant. Now I'm baking cookies and wearing cute dresses in order to find a husband. Help. Uh, if you're baking cookies and wearing cute dresses, you don't need my help, believe me. <laughs> you know, I see this all the time, these women who dress so nicely in skirts and, and blouses and all that. It looks so much better than the women who just like slobs or dress in those kind of hyper-sexy things. Anyway, you'll do fine, believe me. So let's get to today's episode, the one where I talk about Matthew Perry. So here is an ad I love to read. This is an ad for Preborn. Who would not want to help mothers and their children in crisis? Preborn is the largest provider of free ultrasounds in the United States. They connect with women who are considering abortion and offer them a free ultrasound so they can hear their child's heartbeat. This divine connection has proven to double the probability that a mother will choose to carry her child to term. Every day, Preborn's network of clinics saves 200 babies' lives. But it doesn't stop there. They offer mothers maternity clothes, doctor visits, and the support they'll need to raise a child after giving birth. An incredible organization. I am proud to stand behind it, proud to advertise it on my show. You can support Preborn with a gift of just 28 bucks. This will cover the cost of one free ultrasound and could save the life of an unborn child. To donate, just dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, baby, or donate securely at preborn.com slash Andrew. That's preborn.com slash Andrew. And no, I am not going to give you the usual truisms about fame and God and so on, even though some of those are true. I really do want to talk about Matthew Perry and his death, and this will be different and new. So let's get right to chapter one. Could I be more stupid or dead? Now, please don't think that I'm making fun of Matthew Perry's death with that title, Could I Be More Stupid or Dead? It's his joke that he said was going to be on his headstone, and I thought it was—it reflected something really open and honest and vulnerable about him, which was the reason people loved him, not just his audience. I knew people who worked with him, and he was obviously a very damaged guy, but he was a very appealing person. And I, I talked about him once before when I read his memoir, 
But I think it's worth coming back to now. Obviously, you've probably heard, he, he, you all know, he played Chandler Bing on Friends. And he died at the age of 54 in his hot tub and the cause of death is pending. But obviously, drugs killed him. He may not have been on drugs now, uh, but he, a lifetime of drug addict and alcohol, uh, an alcoholic. And he was still apparently taking prescription drugs, which are also drugs. But obviously, this just ripped him to pieces. But I want to recap uh, what I said last time about this. Every year, I do a lot of difficult reading, a lot of research reading, and reading for the show and for personal growth and all that stuff. And right around this time of year, right around November, the end of the year, I finish my list of books that I had to read, and I allow myself to read easier stuff. Now, I don't know why I picked up um, Matthew Perry's memoir, uh, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing. I ca- don't care at all about celebrities. I'm bored silly by addiction stories, because once somebody is an addict, the story is really not about a human being, it's just about the drugs. But I always found Matthew Perry kind of appealing. I, I, I wasn't a big Friends fan either, by the way. I loved the first two years. I thought the first two years were really re- well written. And then it just became silly as they aged out of the of the place there should be, but didn't really move on and had kids out of wedlock. And I thought it was, it was not a very good show at that point. But I always liked him, partly for personal reasons. He reminded me of one of my brothers who no longer speaks to me because of my voting for Trump. And I, I love him still, and I miss him, and he just always connected with me that way, so I liked him. And uh, and I started to listen to his book, just thinking, all right, I'm listening on the elliptical machine at the gym, right? I, I became obsessed with it. I mean, I drove my wife crazy. I was talking about it endlessly, because the guy had this typical... Gen X trauma life. His parents got divorced. He had a working mother and he wanted to fill that hole of missing parental love. And he went to fill it with fame. And he prayed this prayer. He talked about this prayer, uh, cut one. For the first time in my life, I knelt down and prayed. And that prayer was, please God, make me famous. You can do anything you want to me. Just make me famous. Three weeks later, I got friends. And God did not forget about the second part. (laughs) I mean, I I had the American dream happen to me. I got the great job. I was good at it. I I bought a house. The house had a pool. uh, And I really, really liked it. Loved it for about six months. And then I walked in my house and went, oh, man, this is not fixing this problem that I have. His, his history was amazing, and this is why I got obsessed with it. Every wish he had came true. Now, I'm a person who's had a lot of things, accomplished a lot of the things I set out to do in my life, but this guy hit everything. It, top This top show, I mean, Friends is an iconic television show that everybody who was around at that time remembers. He had the number one movie the whole nine yards at the same time. He had the number one TV show. He sleeps with every beautiful actress, has an affair with Julia Roberts that he ends because he feels that he's not worthy of her. Even when he writes this memoir about what a drug addict he was, it's a number one bestseller. And all the while this is happening, he is pouring amounts of alcohol and drugs into his body that are mind-boggling, not just to him, but anybody paying attention. He destroys his body, destroys himself. His stomach explodes. He literally dies. His teeth fall out. It's just I, but he doesn't stop. He just keeps going back and back. And he goes into every rehab program imaginable. Millions of dollars. He finds God. I mean, he does everything that you think he should do. You think, well, maybe you should find God. Maybe you should put, you know, fame, second rank, and maybe all this stuff. He does it all. He ends up saying, you know, friends was not the most important thing about me. Here's cut two. My life has gone to such low degrees with addiction that the lower the scale I go, the more helpful I can be to other people who have gone so low. For some reason, it's obviously because I was on Friends, more people will listen to me. So I've got to take advantage of that. I've got to help as many people as I can. The best thing about me, bar none, is if somebody comes up to me and says, I can't stop drinking, can you help me? I can say yes and follow up and do it. The thing is, the fact is, that even though he ultimately says he stopped taking drugs, I don't, I don't know, but I don't really care because it doesn't really make a difference to what I'm saying. It, he never beats his addiction. And he says this himself. I'm not putting this on him. He says himself, he simply wears his body out to the point where the addiction dies. I mean, he's such a wreck. He's such a physical wreck. And as I said, he's still taking prescription drugs for anxiety and all these things. But what I found so fast, you know, whenever you read a story like this, 
you want life lessons. That's what you, people look for. They want simple life lessons. I remember this Simpsons episode where Homer is reading the TV les- listing, and every show is so and so learns a lesson about sharing when such and such happens, and every show is, is some lesson. Somebody learns a lesson about this when this happens, and, and that's what we want. We want to look at this guy's life, which is a complicated life of an intelligent, talented man, and we want lessons so we can move on to our own addictions, but still feel better about ourselves because we're not him. We're not doing what he's doing. So. Here's a couple of lessons that I'll take away, and they're different from what everybody else says. He calls his his memoir uh, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing, and by that he means that addiction is a disease, and he's very, very firm about this. He gets very angry when anybody challenges him about this. Addiction is not a disease. We have a word for diseases. It's diseases, and we have a word for addiction. It's addiction, and when you change those words, it doesn't do anything a damn thing about it. Just like men aren't women and retarded people aren't special and crippled people aren't otherly mobile, addiction is addiction. Changing the names of things may work for a moment, but ultimately the meaning catches up with them. And people say, people say, well, it is a disease because it changes your brain chemistry. Love changes your brain chemistry. Taking a walk in the woods changes your brain chemistry. That's what the brain is. The brain is a router, like the one in your desk, is a router for communicating spiritual truths to your physical body so you can experience them as a physical entity. You do not get excited because you have epinephrine or adrenaline coursing through you. You get excited because you're on a roller coaster, and the way your body tells you you're excited is by telling you to inject yourself with adrenaline. So why do we have to tell this lie? Why do we have to tell this lie? And the reason I say it's important is because he never beats this thing, and he spends millions and millions and millions of dollars on one rehab place after another. Nothing, nothing works. We tell ourselves this because otherwise we feel we're ashamed. We're ashamed. We, we're ashamed. We're putting poison into our body. And you're saying, don't shame him. Don't shame him for doing that. We're putting poison into our body to dull the pain of living. And life, life is what God made us for. This is like, you know, the big thing about it. You know, you read the Bible. It's like, you, I want you to have life in abundance. And we're ashamed because we're not living. We're drugging ourselves instead. And this is the reason I think nothing worked for Perry is that he never let go of the lie. Here's the thing. You're not being shamed because you're an addict. You're ashamed because you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. You're not being fat shamed. You're ashamed because you eat too much. You're not slut shamed. You're ashamed because you treat your body like it's some kind of sex toy. People can help you with these things. And and I do believe that people should get into programs that help because you can do better things together than you can alone. I, I believe and I have given some things up. The only thing I've ever been really addicted to are cigarettes. But still, I've given things up that I thought were bad for me. If you break that chain, God will, I swear, send angels to your side to assist you. It's that first step that you have to take. You have to take it yourself. And that's why I admire Perry's joke, because no matter how much he insists this is a disease, in the end, he says, on my headstone, it's going to say, could I be more stupid or dead? Because no matter what the people who took his millions of dollars at the rehab centers did, he knew, ultimately, he knew the truth. This is not a disease. This is something he was doing. You can't give up a disease. You can give up an addiction. You can't give up cancer, but you can give up cigarettes. Now, the other one, of course, is fame. And this is really so much more complicated than especially right-wing. Conservatives love simple these simple bromides, and, and they're not, they can't help you. What he says is true. Fame doesn't fix it. Fame is not going to fix anything. There's a famous piece in The Village Voice. Timothy Keller, uh, the the great preacher, used to quote it. Uh, It's by Cynthia Heimel, who lived in Greenwich Village with a lot of aspiring actors. And she wrote, I pity celebrities. I do. The minute a person becomes a celebrity is the same minute he or she becomes a monster. Sylvester Stallone. These are all people she knew. Bruce Willis, Barbara Streisand were once perfectly pleasant human beings with whom you might lunch on a slow Tuesday afternoon, but now they've become supreme beings and their wrath is awful. All their fantasies have been realized, yet the reality was still the same. If they were miserable before, they were twice as miserable now because that giant thing they were striving for, that fame thing that was going to make everything okay, that was going to make their lives bearable, that was going to provide them with personal fulfillment and happiness had happened, and nothing changed. They were still them. The disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. So everything that she said and everything that Perry said is is true of fame, right? but, But that creates a dilemma that people don't talk about. Of course you want to love your work. Of course you want to do your work without thinking about whether or not it's going to make you famous. But but if you're an actor or a writer, you're trying to communicate. I don't write to express myself. I write to communicate my vision of the world 
to you so that at three o'clock in the morning, you will not be alone, but can reach for my book and say, oh yes, somebody else is out there living the thing that I'm living, seeing the things that I'm seeing. And one of the ways you can tell you communicated is that people go to see your movie or they buy your book. Great writer, fame is, is no judge of, of success at your work. Great writers have died in obscurity. Great actors have been in great movies that bombed. And sometimes crap makes you utterly famous. Writing absolute garbage makes you utterly famous and the stuff is forgotten 10 minutes later, but you're a rich man, so hooray for you. But how are you supposed to respond to doing work that is meant to communicate, if not hoping that you will be, that you will communicate, that people will like what you do? You know, in church, they warn you about this stuff all the time. They warn you about the world, the flesh, and the devil, right? And a lot of Christians think, ooh, I have to stay away from the world. I don't want to be part of the world. I don't want to, I don't want to satisfy the flesh. And obviously, you want to avoid the devil, and that's, that's perfectly true. But that's really Eastern religion. Eastern religion says we suffer for our desires, therefore we should teach ourselves to desire nothing. So don't become an actor because you want to be famous. Just become an actor because it is what you are. But that's not actually what Jesus says. He said, I want you to live. I want you to have life in abundance. And that means taking up your cross because take, living is suffering. Wanting is suffering. Ambition, desire, all these things are suffering. Take up your cross and live. Or as Jesus would have said, Lachaim, because he was a Jewish person. The world and the flesh are the places where we experience the good things in life. You experience the good things in life like sex and like a glass of wine and like fame and like success. All these things are good things. And it's also the place where we feel all the pain that we feel when things don't work, when your spouse leaves, when somebody dies. All these things are experienced in the flesh and in the world. And life, <laughs> life experiencing life is exquisitely painful and beautiful. Artists, I think, actually may feel it. And artists and women, I think, feel it a little bit more. But to live, to truly live, to live the way Jesus is talking about, to live in abundance, conscious and awake and alive, it is overwhelming and it takes all your will and yourself away and it gives you bliss, it gives you joy. Everyone prefers death because it's so painful to live. It's so exquisitely painful to live. And that's what Jesus was yelling at you about. Don't do the death stuff, the anger and the worry stuff and the lust and the greed stuff. Do the life stuff. Love, forgive, walk on water. He didn't promise you eternal death. He promised eternal life. And he didn't mean after you die. He meant starting right this minute. Eternal life is right this minute. So here is the life lesson from Matthew Perry for me. And then I'll let him rest in peace. I, I used to play tennis. I lived to win. I lived and died on whether I won or lost. I was a mediocre player, if that. On good days, I was a truly, truly mediocre player. But I was fast. I'm like a jackrabbit. I'm really, really fast. And I poured my heart and soul into every game. It was shocking. It was shocking how much I wanted to win, how much I felt abandoned by God if I started to lose, especially a game that I should have won. I lost sleep over it some nights. There were times when I was tempted to cheat by calling a close ball the wrong way. And I, the first time that happened to me, I was absolutely shocked that I would do something to cheat my integrity to win a game that meant nothing. No money, no prestige, no honor, nothing. But I wanted to win that much. And one day, my mother was visiting me and I came in and she said, why do you care so much? And I said, because it's no fun if you don't give it everything you have. It's not a fun game to just go out there and hit the ball around. You have to play to win. So the weird thing about life, about playing life, is you have to give it everything and care with all your heart and try to succeed at what you want to succeed in, whether it's mother motherhood or writing or whatever it is, and not care at all at the same time. Because it doesn't matter. What matters is that when you play, that when you want to win, that when you give everything you have, you become a person, you can still be a person who is fair, generous, and sportsmanlike. That is the secret of life. This is in the Bible, they say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all the rest will come as it should come. It's no good if everyone gets a trophy. Then you don't care and that's not fun, right? Then it's not a game. It only works if there are thrilling victories and agonizing defeats, thrilling gains, and just absolutely crushing losses 
And you have to be willing to feel them with your whole heart and know that it's meaningless at the same time. And that is so hard. It is so hard to do. It is so hard to love sex as much as most men love sex and yet realize that you have to do it with a certain person, in a certain way, with certain things behind it. That is what makes you a person. The, the, it's a tension between those things. And it is it's exquisitely painful, it's exquisitely beautiful, and it destroys the self. It's like being ravished by an angel to live at that level. And I, because it's so painful and so exquisite and so present, I can make a zillion dollars selling you everything that kills it. Fear, worry, anger, antidepressants, pot, microdoses on LSD, whatever will make you stop living. I can win fame and wealth and followers and prestige and the Nobel Peace Prize by selling you death and killing your soul. See, this is the thing. We are all addicted to something that keeps us from living. And when we see Matthew Perry, we can say, well, he was, he did, oh, he was that, 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 you know, I, but now I'm just going to go back to smoking dope or looking at porn or not paying attention, which is the thing almost all of us do. <laughs> that, that is the addiction. Most of us are addicted to death. We're addicted to not being fully alive. We are addicted to not being fully alive. Addiction is not a disease, but it does have a cure. And I hope and pray, I truly do, that Matthew Perry has now found peace with the God who loves him more than he ever knew. But we are still here. And this is our mission now is to live, to live. And we are here among death merchants. And that's what I want to talk about today. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from top companies and find your lowest price. Their licensed agents work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal information is kept private. This is important stuff. You've got to have life insurance. I know no one wants to think about it, but it is super satisfying to check life insurance off your to-do list because you need it. A good life insurance plan can give you peace of mind that if something happens to you, your family will have a safety net to cover mortgage payments, college costs, or other expenses. Life insurance through your workplace may not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and it won't follow you if you leave your job. Since life insurance typically gets more expensive as we age, now's the time to buy. Policy Genius makes the process so much easier. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just 292 bucks per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Go to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. By Chapter 2, Cartman's Nightmare. I think that the culture of death that Disney, for instance, and Hollywood and the left has been trying to sell us I think it's starting to sicken us. And I think the culture, which is all of us together, what all of us feel together, is starting to fight back. Disney is trying to sell us this sick perversion of our children. Everything is being perverted to keep us from living, to keep us from the difficult business of life, which is a business. You know, all the stuff that Jesus tells you not to do, that the Bible tells you not to do, the Ten Commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't covet, all of that stuff, you're not not doing it because that's the point. You're getting that stuff out of the way so you can do the business of life, which is living, which is living intensely, living so intensely that it's almost unbearable, but it's almost unbearably joyful. The people who live like that are mother, new mothers when they first have a baby in their arms. That, I, I was just watching a movie about fentanyl, and the guy said, that's what fentanyl gives you. Fentanyl gives you that feeling, and that's why people get addicted to it. But you're supposed to be able, you have everything you need to do it without fentanyl, without anything really, except one another, except other people. So the culture is now starting to wake up that to the death merchants. There's this hilarious trailer going around. It's really wonderful. It's called uh, American Fiction. Uh, this is by a guy named Cord Jefferson, who's an American writer, director, journalist, and essayist who worked on t the TV series Watchmen, Succession, and The Good Place. So he's done quality work. And it's about this obsession now in publishing, which I have seen myself and I've talked to writers who've seen it, and all entertainment, publishing and all entertainment, to eliminate all the white characters and all the European values because that was 
too oppressive, but really what it was, was too alive. It was too good. It was too full and rich. And it was burbling up with all this stuff. Now, no, no, that's too much life. Too much life, so it has to die. And we're going to replace them with, it seems like they're going to replace them with black people, black women and minorities and indigenous people and woke values. But that's a lie. It's a lie. It's all death. They pick the black people to represent death and say, see, we're putting out black people. But it's not. It's not real black people. It's black people as white people imagine them because they are too guilt-ridden to live in abundance, all right? Death, you know, death has masks. It comes in the devil wears masks. It comes in many masks. And so this mask is the mask of the leftist white people's imagination of black people. So in this movie, American Fiction, the publishing industry wants to lift up black people, but they don't want to lift up real black people. They want stories about blacks playing the guilty white people's version, image of black people. So they want black people to come and tell them to die. That's what they want. So it starts this trailer. It's really funny if you if you work in publishing. I hope People will get it if they don't. A perfectly well-educated black author is being interviewed about her new book, is Cut 7. How did you come to write this book? What really struck me was that too few books were about my people. Where are our stories? Where's our representation? Would you give us the pleasure of reading an excerpt? Yo, Sharonda, girl, you be pregnant again? If I is, Ray Ray is going to be a real father this time around. (laughs) And all the white people stand up and cheer. So the plot of the movie is I get it from this trailer, is this one highly educated guy. I think he's a college professor. He's played by Jeffrey Wright, a very appealing actor. And he writes a book called Pathology. (laughs) It's it's really funny. It's not pathology. It's pathology. And it's complete nonsense about his street life, which he never lived. And he has to pretend to be this thug in order to get this book to come out. And he's doing it as a joke. And of course, it becomes a huge, huge success. And it's because he is selling not black people, not the actual yearnings and ambitions and desires of black people, but that image of death that white people, especially leftist white people, are imposing on blacks in the guise of George Floyd, in the guise of, you know, um, Ibram Kendi, and all these people who are telling you, die. Your culture is too strong. Your culture is too powerful. Your culture is too creative. Really, what black people want and have wanted traditionally is to become part of it. It's a great culture. It's, who cares what color the people who were invented it, the door is open, come in and succeed in these terms. But no, the merchants of death are saying no. So South Park, God bless them, they're still here. South Park has taken to mocking this too as Cartman has these bad dreams that not only he, but all of the beloved South Park characters are being replaced by black women. So here he is waking up from one of his dreams. Cut eight. Ah! 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 Eric, it's okay. It's got... okay. Ma, ma, I had a dream that I was replaced by a diverse woman. Oh, not again. Yeah, only this time, it wasn't just me. They were taking all my favorite people and replacing them with diverse women complaining about the patriarchy. Will you check under the bed and make sure there's no Disney executives under there? I promise there's not. I'm scared, Mom. Will you please just look and make sure Kathleen Kennedy isn't under my bed? Kathleen Kennedy is not under your bed. Can you check the closet? Eric, enough! I've told you there's no such thing as Disney executives who replace everyone you love with diverse women who complain about the patriarchy. <laughs> no, that's great. I love it. This is so just, just to show you how real it is, not really even satire. Disney has been wanting to make a remake of the Blade movies, really fun action adventure movies about a good vampire, basically. And they starred Wesley Snipes, a great action character who's, if you don't remember him, he's a black guy. And remember when the media idiots were saying, oh, the Black Panther is here. There's a first black superhero. These book, these films were big successes in the 90s. They made three of them. So they want to remake them. Who do they get to remake Blade? Uh, Maharshala Ali. I think the guy's won two Oscars, right? I mean, he's a really good actor, very appealing, very popular, all right? So here's Variety, the trade paper of show business. With Marshala Ali signed on for the eponymous role of a vampire, things looked promising for a 2023 release. But the project has gone through at least five writers, two directors, and one shutdown six weeks before production. Why? One person familiar with the script permutations says the story at one point morphed into a narrative led by women and filled with life lessons. 
Blade was relegated to the fourth lead, a bizarre idea considering that the studio had two-time Oscar winner Ali on board. So uh, South Park isn't even doing satire. Now they have the writer of Logan who really did a good job on that uh, to write it. And let's see, and they've cut the budget as well. The black people we elevate are merchants of death. They're merchants of death. They're not black people. They're not black people who would be thrilled to have jobs and education and to really be lifted out of the culture that destroys them. They're, they're people Black people are there. The black people that the left or the culture elevates are people meant to keep them there and not just keep them there, but drag us down to that level. A drug addicted thug like George Floyd, bigoted nitwits like Ibram Kendi and Nicole Hannah Jones, Ta-Nehisi Coates. You know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, I've heard, is not a bad guy or anything like this, but this is a guy who was glad when 9-11 happened. That's how much he hated his country. He wrote in his book, uh, about the police and the firefighters who died running into the building to save people. They were not human to me, black, white, or wherever. They were menaces of nature. They were the fire, the comet, the storm, which could, with no justification, shatter my body. That is how much he hates Western culture and still does. Here he is talking about the current moment in the Middle East, uh, Cup 13. We have to stand on principle. And if I'm a latecomer to the Palestinian cause, I'm also a latecomer to the cause of nonviolence, but I'm here now. There is no way in the world that we can leverage the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King. There's no way in the world we can leverage uh, the weight, the ancestry of our movement in defense of a war, in defense of indiscriminate bombings. And I would look out and I would see roads that Palestinians could use and roads that only Israeli Jews could use. I said, I, I know what this is. As I saw different colored license plates for different classes of people, I said, I, I know what this is. As I saw communities that I can only describe as, as segregated. And what I felt was a tremendous weight. I felt the obvious thing that I think all of us feel that our tax dollars are effectively subsidizing apartheid, or, or subsidizing a segregationist order a Jim Crow regime. Now, this is all nonsense, and I don't want to even argue about it. I mean, this is a, a, a embattled little country, Israel, embattled by powers far, far greater than theirs, funded by Iran, fighting for their lives. There's no, there, this is not a two-sided issue. I mean, obviously, I don't want the innocent to be harmed, but that's what war is, and it's a terrible thing, and I hate war, but there it is. Hamas are Nazis. They're merchants of death. They say so themselves. They're merchants of exterminating the Jews, the Jews who are, in fact, the culture of L'chaim, the culture of life, of freedom. Israel is a place where all, you know, this is the thing that drives me nuts. Israel is a place where all religions are allowed to celebrate. Nobody's uh, oppressed. The women are free. That's not true of any other country in the Middle East. It is not true of any other country of the Middle East. And Israel, by this nutty death wish, it becomes the villain, becomes the apartheid country. The the Jews are the, chil are the children of the God of life. I, I know I keep saying this. It's all about the God. There's no other way to explain this. There's no other way to explain the oldest hatred. It has to be as old as as God himself. It's, it's this hatred, this fight with life that we're having. All of us have it. All of us have it to some degree, but some of us at least are striving toward the light of life, not Hamas and not the people who support Hamas and not the people who bring Hamas up to a, an equal level with the, Jew, the Israeli culture, which is a culture of freedom and, uh, and equality, essentially. And that brings me to chapter three, I'll be there for Jew. Are you struggling to sleep at night? I've given up the struggle, but did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lowered productivity? Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health and performance. That's why I look like this. You must have a consistent nighttime routine to function at your best. If you're struggling with sleep, check out Beam. Beam is designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Beam's Dream Powder contains a powerful, all natural blend of ingredients, including magnesium L-theanine. They sent some dream powder down to the studio for my team to try, and that's the last I've seen of them. Everyone says that Beam is helping them fall asleep and stay asleep. Unlike regular sleeping pills that will make you wake up feeling groggy, Beam 
helps you wake up ready to go. Just mix Bean Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. Today, my listeners can get a special discount on Beam's delicious dream powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa and chocolate peanut butter. Better sleep has never tasted better. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time at shopbeam.com slash Clavin. Be sure to use code Clavin at checkout in memorial to me who hasn't slept in years. That's shopbeam.com slash Clavin. Use code Clavin for up to 40% off. How do you spell it, you ask? Of course you ask that. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no easy I want to return to this issue of morality for just a second because what we're talking about here is how to live. We're talking about life. We're talking about playing the game of life with intensity, experiencing the shame of the things that we do wrong and the joy of the love we're supposed to feel, experiencing these things, the intensity of these things. And like I said, it's like being ravished when you actually have those moments when you are fully alive, experiencing what we really love, not what we're supposed to love, not the things we're told to buy on television, taking the earplugs out of our ears, not until I'm finished talking, but still taking the earplugs out of our ears and hearing the things around us, seeing the things, getting that phone out of our face. I see, I see young people, we all see this, I know, young people sitting together, looking at their phones. No, no, don't do it. I mean, these are the things that people sell you because they can make money off them. They sell you because they, they profit off them by taking away your life. Morality is simply the way of clearing away the death, of clearing away the addictions, getting rid of the dope, getting rid of too much alcohol, getting rid of the porn, getting rid of the lust, right? The covetous lust, getting rid of all the, you know, the materialism, the money, the money hunger, you know, there's nothing wrong with money. All these things, you know, a lot of these things are good things, you know, desire is a good thing. Sex is a good thing. Money is a good thing. All those things are good things. It's making them into idols so that you don't have to see the real thing. That's what an idol is. An idol is a replacement for the real thing. And the first step to doing that is is morality. You, you know, this is the thing. You have to be, have a moral sense in order to know where life is. Because if you can't tell the difference between good or bad, you, you don't even know what direction you're moving in. If you are sitting around talking about Hamas like they matter beyond being a target for the Israeli army, you, something's gone wrong. See, this is the thing. This is the thing about Jew hatred. And I'm not talking, by the way, about white-shoed bigotry that everybody experiences. Oh, I don't want that person at my club or something like that. I'm talking about this real hatred of, of expelling and killing and denying the existence and wanting to exterminate people. If you find yourself hating Jews, if you find yourself blaming Jews, wake up. If you find yourself hurting people, if you find yourself putting hard hands on your wife, if you find yourself drinking when you should be taking care of your children, wake up. Just stop. You know, this is what, what the first words in the, in the New Testament, repent, metanoia, change, change your heart, change your mind. Here's who Hamas is, okay? Here's a Jewish guy who goes out into a free Palestine march. He goes out undercover and asks them what they mean. What's going to happen to the Jews? Cut six. I'm a Jew going undercover at a free Palestine rally to see what the real is about. Hey, how would you describe a Jew? They're, they're devils. Who's at fault? The Jews. The Jews. Always been a problem. So if they do take Palestine, where do the 12 million Jews go? Go to hell. Yeah, that's the literal slogan. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Okay, if we free Palestine, where do the Jews go? Hey, go back to Brooklyn! All right, now I want you to listen to the New York Times. Remember I was telling you, if you're going to buy the House of Love and Death, if you're going to get it as a Christmas present, get it now so we can at least make it so it should be on the New York Times list. I want to read to you from the New York Times, a former newspaper, some of the ways they're covering this war, which are shocking. They are absolutely shocking if you still have the capacity to be shocked by the mainstream media, the legacy media. Here's one. How posters of... You know, people are tearing down the posters of the kidnapped Israelis, right? And the only reason to do this is because you can't face what's, what you actually believe in. That's, that's the reason you do it. You're, not tearing, you're tearing it down because you cannot look at what you're supporting when you support Hamas. You can't look at it. You're not just wearing masks so no one sees you. You're also tearing these down so they're, it's not in front of your eyes what these bastards did. You cannot see that and support them in the same way people can't look at pictures of abortions and still be pro-choice. That's, that, that is why you want to kill those things. You want to make sure you don't see them. So here's the headline in the New York Times, how posters, 
how posters of kidnapped Israelis ignited a firestorm on American sidewalks. Those posters, those rotten posters out there igniting a firestorm, those rotten posters, they're like those guns that going around killing people and those trucks that drive over people. I, just because they happen to have Islamists at the wheel, but it's the trucks. Those posters have to come down. They have to come down because they speak the truth. Here's what the Times says. The battle over the posters has inflamed already tense emotions, and it captures one of the most fervently debated questions of the war. Whose suffering should command public attention and sympathy? Well, BS. That is not the question of the war. The question is whether Israel has to go to war to survive, and of course it does. As I say, war is a grave evil. You fight a war to keep a graver evil from occurring. The war against the Nazis was a grave evil. We bombed Dresden, the, popu- the civilian population of Dresden. We bombed the civilian pit population of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This war is a grave evil, but you do it to stop an even greater evil, which is Hitler running the world. And in this case, Hamas wiping the population of the Jews off the face of of the earth. Here's another another headline from the New York Times. How years of Israeli failures on Hamas led to a devastating attack. <laughs> they might have just, well, you know, when you really think about it, weren't the Jews to blame for the Holocaust? Didn't they really kill them? Isn't it? People blame Hitler, but, what, you know, Hitler it was just standing there when the Jews started to gas themselves. Here's, here's another one. In protests against Israel, Israel strikes, GOP sees woke agenda at colleges. Couldn't possibly be that the stuff that the New York Times has been pushing for all these years, this woke garbage, which is the culture of death. Woke is death. This woke garbage couldn't possibly be that it's the reason that people hate Jews on college campuses. It must just be the, those pouncing, you know, like Tigger, they're pouncing Republicans. The culture is waking up. You see it in these little things like, this, like South Park and this movie American Fiction. You see people starting to say, you know, I'm a black guy and that's not me. Or, you know, I don't want to be replaced by black people, not because I dislike pe- black people, but because I'm worthwhile. I, the, the culture of Europe is worthwhile. The culture of America is worthwhile. And I don't want these people basically saying you should be replaced if they want to join in. That's very different. But to say that you should be replaced is very different. The news media and the left are saying, no, no, life, you know, we want death. We want the death. Don't go Don't go back to being proud of your country. Don't go back to being proud of freedom. Don't go back to supporting Israel, a free country. Go at, at and support Hamas, the culture of death. You know, the atrocities of October 7th is not the work of God, obviously. That's not the work of God. That's the work of man. But the horror that we feel, that a normal person feels when something like happened, that's the work of God. That's a gift of God, you know? C.S. Lewis said we can ignore pleasure but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. That's why I hate the movie. I despise the movie Schindler's List. I despise it. You know that, I mean, Steven Spielberg has marvelous talent. And if he had made a small movie to say this is a little single incident that had happened in this massive evil, but he didn't. He made the Steven Spielberg Holocaust movie. This is the American movie of the Holocaust. And it's baloney. The Holocaust was not about hope. It wasn't about heroism. heroism. It wasn't about saving lives. It was a darkness like no other. In the Holocaust, courage and decency was killing your son so he wouldn't suffer the long, torturous death imposed on him by the Nazis. Read read Eli Wiesel's Night if you want to know what the Holocaust was really about. And I'll tell you something else it wasn't about. The Holocaust was not from God. The horror we feel at the Holocaust and the conscience we feel, that's from God. That's an arrow away from death to life. Here's the other thing, the other lie that we've been told about the Holocaust. The Holocaust was not about bigotry. It was not about racism. It was not about othering. It was not about gay people, though some gay people were oppressed and killed during the Holocaust. It was not about black people, though certainly Hitler despised them and thought they were nothing. It was about the Jews. It was about hatred of the Jews. World War II itself was a war against the Jews. Hitler put conquering the world second to killing the Jews. He wanted to kill the Jews. The Holocaust was not about evil and good. It was not about love and hate. It was about killing Jews. And the reason that people hate the Jews, as I keep saying, because it's the only explanation that makes sense, is because they hate God. And the reason they hate God is that if you 
open your heart to God, he will ravish you with life. He will fill you with life. I have experienced this myself. I'm not talking off the top of my head. I'm not saying some idealistic garbage. I am telling you what it is like to let God into your life. It is like being ravished with life. You lose yourself. You lose. You become indifferent to things about yourself. You, be, you lose envy. You lose all kinds of things that you were clinging on to with your whole life. And it is the Jews who wrote the book. They literally wrote the book about God. The Jews wrote both volumes. They wrote both volumes about it. And we want it to stop. We want that experience of God to stop. This is why people are picking on this guy, Mike Johnson, you know, this, the new Speaker of the House, because he came out and said, he came out and said, you know, I believe in God. The Bible is my worldview. That's, you want to know my worldview? Read the Bible and that's it. Here's, here's Bill Maher responding to that. Cut four. I was reading about this horrible shooting in Maine. Yeah. Uh, and I heard, you know, we don't know much about the guy yet, but apparently he heard voices. And I thought, is he that different than Mike Johnson? <laughs> Really? I mean, degree, yes, but it's thinner than you think. Is it? Because Bill Maher, I watch him smoking dope and drinking on TV, and it's cute, and it's funny, and all this stuff, and it's a way of killing life. It's a way of putting a curtain between yourself and life so you don't have the exquisite painful, beautiful, lovely, God-sent experience of living. This is what everyone should be doing every day is living more. And what everyone wants to do is live less like Matthew Perry. And that's, that's why I don't look at him and say, oh, he was this and I'm this, because I know this is what all of us are trying to do. All of us are trying to escape from life. And the best way to do that is to silence it, cut it off, get stoned, make your head fuzzy, and most importantly, silence the truth. And that's why our final chapter is called The One We're Shut Up. One thing I love is a nice dinner, and I always have a drink, maybe two to go with it, but those post-dinner drinks can lead to a not-so-nice morning the next day. That's where Z-Biotics, Z-Biotics comes into play. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut. This byproduct, not dehydration, is what is to blame for your rough next day. Z-Biotics is designed to produce an enzyme that will break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. My producer, Danny, loves Z-Biotics. He always wakes up refreshed and ready to go after a night out. Others around the office love Z-Biotics for those Thursday night football games so they can still have a few beers and not miss work the next day. Just remember to drink Z-Biotics before drinking alcohol and then drink responsibly and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Go to zbiotics.com slash Clavin to get 15% off your first order with code Clavin at checkout. Z-Biotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. That's zbiotics.com slash Clavin and use the code Clavin at checkout for 15% off your first order. If you can remember how to spell Clavin, there are no E's in Clavin. I just make it look this easy. There are no E's in Clavin. I really do believe that the culture is starting to come back to life. I think it's been, I've never seen anything in my life like this, how dead it's been, how bad everything is, how, how wokeness has smothered and killed everything. Stuff like what I'm doing, the House of Love and Death, this is happening under the radar because we're a small publisher. Mysterious Press is a smallish publisher and they're letting me get away with it. And even there, I'm having problems. My daughter has her book, Christmas Carol, that's coming out through the Daily Wire. This is a new thing. What Jeremy's uh, overseas doing with his project uh, it, it is, is a new new thing that's happening, and it's bringing the culture back to life, and it's delicate, and they want to stop it. They want to kill it dead. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm, it is so much more important, and I know elections are important. I'm not you know, minimizing them, but it's so much more important that artists are beginning to speak again. They're beginning to speak about morality again. They're beginning to speak about love again. They're beginning to speak about children again, because you know what? We not only need more children, we need more pregnant women. We need more pregnant women. We need more women full of life. We need more women committed to life and to nurturing and to walking away from the values of capitalism, which ultimately, listen, capitalism is a great financial system, but if that's your system, if that's your whole system, you're going to be a dead man. Everything is about silencing this. 
Everything is about silencing this. Everything is about silencing the truth because the truth is life. The truth is that God is life. You know, that, that's the truth. The truth is that God wants to give you life in abundance and everything is about silencing it. You know, this court case that exposed the Twitter f- files, the name of it escapes me in the moment, but you know, this, this thing where they actually told the government to stop, uh, stop going to social media and telling them what they can and can't say. And now the Supreme Court has said, all right, you can go back, but we're going to hear it. So they're going to come to a decision about whether this is a violation of the First Amendment. But here's Elon Musk talking about what Twitter was when he took it over and what he, why he wants to change it. He's talking to Rogan. There was uh, basically oppression of um, any, any views that would even, I would say, be considered middle of the road. Um, but certainly anything on the, the right. I'm not talking about like, like far right. I'm just talking mildly right. The people, like Republicans were suppressed at 10 times the rate of Democrats. Um, now, that's because uh, old Twitter was fundamentally controlled by the far left. It was like completely controlled by the, the, the far left. So all of these things that were true about the vaccine, about Hunter Biden's laptop, all these truths were being closed off. And the, this is the important thing. That they won't admit that they were even doing it, even though the courts have said they were doing it and gave example after example. So now Rand Paul has, for instance, Christopher Ray, and he's questioning Christopher Ray. has got 11 I'm going to lead into. He's questioning about but whether he tried to censor Twitter. Listen to what Ray says. We're having some interaction with social media companies, but, uh, but all of those interactions have changed fundamentally uh, in the wake of the court's rulings. That's sort of an acknowledgement that perhaps you weren't just talking about national security, child pornography, and human trafficking, right? You had other areas of, of discussion that did involve constitutionally protected speech. No, no, that's not an acknowledgement of but that. then how did you change your behavior? Uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, in, in order to make sure that we don't run afoul of any court ruling, I would say, by the way, of course, that the injunction has been stayed uh, by the Supreme Court. Did, did any, uh, anybody from the FBI ever discuss constitutional Constitutionally protected speech with social media organizations? Not to my understanding. <laughs> we weren't doing it, and now we've stopped. We never did it, and we'll never do it again. Uh, <laughs> this is what they're saying, because they're lying. They're lying. All the silence. But, but, while that is going on, and that's making headlines, and that's they're making some headway about that in the Republican House and, uh, and the Senate, they're making some headway with it. What's happening to the arts is worse. It's uglier. It's disgusting, this thing that Cartman is talking about, that American fiction is talking about. They are going back and editing popular books. Georgette Heyer, uh, she's the woman who virtually invented the gothic romance, you know, those paperbacks with the girl in a nightgown running away from a castle. She, she's still selling millions and millions of copies. Now they're editing out things that they find anti-Semitic because they, she has a Jewish moneylender in one of her stories. P.G. Woodhouse, one of the greatest writers who ever lived, a great British comedy writer, the funniest writer who ever lived, his Jeeves and Worcester novels. I used to read them in a period when I was very sad. I used to read them in the middle of the night, laughed so hard. My wife actually woke up once and hit me over the head with a pillow because I kept waking, waking her up by laughing at P.G. Woodhouse while he had a minstrel show. So they're cutting that out. These sensitivity readers, and of course, James Bond is being made woke. This is so deeply offensive. An artist has a muse. I have a muse. I don't ask your permission to listen to my muse. I don't tailor what my muse tells me for you. I write it because I hope you'll love it. I want you to love it. I want you to to entertain and enlighten and thrill you and all of those things. But no sensitivity reader, no no talent, small-minded, gray-hearted, self-righteous sensitivity reader has any right to tell me what I see even if I was wrong, because it was my vision that I'm giving to you, I'm giving you me. That's what an artist does. I give you me. You have no right to take that away because they have lifted themselves so high, so high that now they see from their great height of Sinai that the whole past was mistaken and only they have got it wrong. This is death. This is death to be cut off from our past, to be cut off from the visions of life that were given to us by great artists like P.G. Woodhouse and and all of the, I mean, they'll get to Shakespeare. They start here because people don't care about P.G. Woodhouse, but they but they'll get to Shakespeare. Believe me, that's that's what Bowdlerize meant. It was by a guy named Bowdler who actually cut Shakespeare to get the get rid of the sex and get rid of the things that offended him. Shakespeare will come back. P.G. Woodhouse will come back. All of these movies, like The French Connection, that they want to take out the N-word from because it was too real. All of this reality, 
all of this reality they want to take away because that's what it is. It's not saying these people were right to feel that way. It's saying that's what they felt. That's what that was the reality. All of reality is it, taking away all of reality is what it's about. Telling black people that they're they want to worship George Floyd for crying out loud, for crying out loud. You know, this is what it's all about. It's about depriving us of reality that we're here to give each other. Remember, the big commandments in the Bible are love God and love your neighbor because this is the source of life. The source of life is one another. You know, sometimes I sit at my window and I look out and there's water outside my window and I watch the, the birds come by and it's true that birds of a feather flock together. I'm always wondering, what does it feel like? Do ducks feel the presence of another duck? Do turtles feel the presence of another turtle? All I know, and I don't know, is humans feel intensely the presence of another person. We all feel this presence and we can feel it through time, past death through the works of art that people create. And these clowns want to erase even that, just like they want to erase the true aspirations of black people, just like they want to erase the true aspirations of women. More than anything, they want to get rid of women because women are the source of life. Women bring life into the world and make life human. They want to get rid of that entirely. All of this stuff, all of this stuff is what we have to claim back and what a culture claims back if it survives. The left, and not just the left, the godless are after a silence because God is the truth and they have to silence that truth. The truth is life. The enemies of life are just what the church says, the world, the flesh, and the devil, or as we call them, the government, the media, and Hamas. Guess what? Thanksgiving is just two weeks away. Just in time for the holidays, GenuCell is offering their best sale of the year. Right now, you can get 70% off. That's 70% off GenuCell's most popular package, which now includes GenuCell 3, their newest under eye treatment. GenuCell 3 will have you looking 10, 15, even 20 years younger. It uses advanced technology to deliver complex vitamins and minerals directly to your face for instant hydration. Say goodbye to fine lines, crow's feet, under eye bags, and dark spots. The GenuCell experience is like no other, but don't just take my word for it. GenuCell will have you looking and feeling your absolute best, guaranteed, or your money back, no questions asked. My producer, Lisa, loves using the GenuCell under eye cream. I can't believe it. I thought she just looked that beautiful. We have the new GenuCell 3 product on the way, so she can add this to her skincare routine. You deserve to look and feel your best this holiday season. Go to GenuCell.com slash Clavin to get this incredible holiday discount for 70% off their most popular package, which includes the GenuCell 3 and the Dark Spot Corrector. Get results in 12 hours or less. The immediate effects are included for free. GenuCell.com slash Clavin for 70% off today, plus free priority shipping. That's GenuCell.com slash Clavin. And by now, you're just begging. You're begging. Please, please, please tell me how to spell Clavin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. You've been asking us for an alternative in kids' media, and now it's finally here. The Daily Wire just launched Bent Key, our brand new kids' entertainment platform. We're all sick of Hollywood pushing leftist propaganda and worse on our kids. Now there's finally an answer for those of us looking for children's shows that we can trust. Bent Key is brand new, ready, and available to download right now. It's an entirely new company from The Daily Wire dedicated to creating the next generation of timeless stories that transport kids into a world of adventure, imagination, and joy. Boy, imagine that. This is exactly what parents have been waiting for. And I don't just say that as someone who works for The Daily Wire. I say that because I am one of those parents and a grandparent who wants to protect their kids and grandkids from corporate media agendas that don't align with values that any sane person would want to teach them. The content is amazing. It's high quality. It's fun. Kids will love it. It totally exceeds my expectations. I've been watching it too. My expectations were high, but they but it's better. I could have never imagined that the Daily Wire was going to provide all of this for its members without increasing the price of an annual membership. It's the greatest value add that we've ever given. It's a $99 value that you get free. And that just goes to show that we don't just talk about changing culture. We put it into action. We really believe in what we're doing. If you're already a Daily Wire Plus member, you already have Ben Key. Just download the app to start streaming now. If you're not a member, Never been more valued to joining than right now. You get all of the Daily Wire Plus content that you know and love, plus Bent Key at no additional cost. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe right now to start streaming the next generation of kids' entertainment. That brings us to Clavin Clapbacks. Woo! You sound like a white male trying to reestablish the patriarchy. Yeah! 
And so I am. From Andrea, in light of the recent and barbaric attacks in Israel, I am wondering how you have over your life come to understand Jesus' words about not resisting one who is evil, but rather turning him also th- the other cheek. Uh, in context such as this existential attack on Israel, I find myself struggling to understand where that teaching fits. Well, I'll tell you what I think, and I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian, but I do read the Bible every day, and I think about it very much. And uh, what I believe that Jesus is trying to do is shape our hearts. Uh, so that we will naturally do what he, what God tells us to do. He wants to write the law on our hearts so that when we don't even hate our enemies, when we don't even hate evil, then we know what has to be done. That doesn't mean it doesn't have to be done. What Israel has to do, it has to do. But it has, it has to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth. It has to. It has to. For all of us, for all of our sakes, it has to do it. But you can do that without hatred. And if you do it without hatred, more people are going to live, fewer innocents are going to die, more justice is going to be installed afterwards, but you still have to do it. And I think it's a question of what's in your heart. And that that really matters. It really does matter what is in your heart, even though sometimes you have to do very harsh and terrible things. All right. Uh, from uh, This is from Matt. I respect your decision to not watch Midnight Mass if you feel it hurting your experience of communion during your show. However, you ask, why would I want to watch something that mixes demonic horror with communion? It's like asking I love my mother. Why would I want to watch a movie about a mother who is bad? Art needs to look honestly at all the human condition. Yeah, I agree with you, Matt. I I was was talking very personally that in that moment, I was just getting into communion and I thought like, I don't want to watch somebody who's going to pollute that with demonry. And my point was, my point was that even though I believe they're absolutely right, Art should deal with all of human life, good and bad, you have to guard your imagination and you have to decide what your imagination needs at any minute. But I agree with you completely. Uh, From Don, I would like you to consider changing your approach to the 2020 presidential presidential election, irregularities. There were provable instances of election fraud that have gone unprosecuted. If there are consequences, the behavior will continue. Uh, Well, Don, you see, what's the result been? People being put in prison for 20 years. There actually have been reforms. Not enough. There haven't been enough reforms. Maybe about 30% of the reforms we need, but there have been reforms and, and things are changing. And I think the GOP has woken up, and I do think there were definitely irregularities. It wouldn't bother me if people were prosecuted. All I'm saying is the way it was dealt with, we lost Georgia. People uh, were enticed into a riot they shouldn't have done that was very, very hurtful to the conservative brand and to Trump. And people are being sent to prison for 20 years. So what did what did that accomplish? You cannot say to the left, your intentions don't matter, your the actual results of your policies matter, and not say it to yourself as well. Um, but, you know, I do believe there should be reform, and I do believe there should be consequences when it helps us, when it actually works. From uh, Douglas, oh, distant mentor of mine, I received an email that the House of Love and Death has shipped, and the positive emotions overwhelm my mind. I finish when Christmas comes, currently enjoying a strange habit of mind. That's one and two in the Cameron Winter series. It's obvious to me that Cameron Winter is yourself in many ways, except, of course, much more of a badass, but your insights into our national dilemma make you a virtual badass in your own right. Absolutely true. Uh, from <laughs> Jacob, um, hello, Lord Clavin, Master of the Universe, big fan of your show, even bigger fan of your novels. My favorites are the Cameron Winter novels and your memoir. I've been dating a girl from my church. We have similar beliefs, values, and ideas about having a family and a future together. The only thing keeping me from making a commitment is the fact that my family has concerns about her. My family has always been very tightly knit, and I would be the first of my parents' four children to leave the nest. I love this girl very much, but I don't want to drive a wedge between me and my family by getting engaged. My question is, should I give it more time? And how do you go about bringing someone into a close family like mine? Jacob, uh, get engaged. Sack up. He asked this girl to marry you, marry her, get her pregnant as quickly as possible and with as much joy as humanly possible. It's up to your family to accept her. It's up to you to draw, uh, build a wall between uh, around the two of you. You're elevating this woman to the highest point place in your life, a place of honor. She is now going to be the woman of your life and the woman of your house. She comes first. She comes before your family of origin. They have to accept her. Now, I've been through this, and sometimes you're going to have to say something to your mom. You know, now this woman is the woman in my life, not you. Love you, mom. But this is now my wife. She has the pl- this place of honor. You're going to have to do that. There's going to be tension <laughs> but you got to grow up. This is growing up. This is becoming a man. This is why your parents raised you. If you don't do this, they've failed. And so you have to do, you know, do the, find the girl you love, start a new family, and hopefully you'll all blend together. It'd be great. But if there's tension, you side with your wife. If there's tension, you side with your wife and you side with your new family. You side with the future, not with the past. Become a member today so you can come to Member Block. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code Claven at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Then you can come to Member Block instead of being plunged as you are right this moment into the clavenless eternity I can't even bear to watch.